previous video on cameras talked about CCD image sensors that have been around in machine vision for a long time. With changes in technology, the dominant type of image sensors is now CMOS. CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor, a specific way of making electronic circuits. In this video, we're going to explore the basics of CMOS image sensors. We're going to start by talking about the simplest form of CMOS image sensor, passive CMOS. After examining the shortcomings of passive CMOS image sensors, we'll explore active pixel CMOS image sensors. We'll follow that by talking about two different ways the exposure is handled, the rolling shutter and the global shutter. Finally, we'll look into how microlenses are applied to CMOS image sensors. We're going to talk about the passive CMOS image sensor, but remember the passive CMOS image sensor isn't used very much anymore, except for maybe low-cost, low-performance applications. Imagine that you have an array of photodiodes, with each photodiode connected by a switch to a vertical output line. Each vertical output line is connected by a switch to a horizontal output line going to an amplifier. By activating pairs of switches, it is possible to connect any photodiode to the output amplifier. In actual fabrication, the switches are nothing more than MOS transistors. While this design of an image sensor is inexpensive to make, it delivers rather poor speed and noise performance. The limitations of passive CMOS can be overcome by using three transistors per pixel. One of the transistors is used as an amplifier. This enables the image sensor to drive a voltage from each pixel instead of a charge packet. That is far more efficient and gives higher speed and better noise performance. Another transistor serves as a reset transistor for the photodiode. The third transistor is the row select transistor, identical to what is used in passive CMOS sensors. Let's see how this works in a more simplified diagram. We have the photodiode, we have the reset switch, we have the amplifier, and we have the row select. The photodiode is reset. When the reset is removed, incoming photons create photogenerated charge. The photogenerated charge creates a voltage on the output of the amplifier. That voltage is read out when the row select transistor is activated. In an actual image sensor, typically each column has an amplifier with a small capacitor to hold the voltage during the readout of the row. At the end of the first row's exposure, the row is selected and the voltage from each photo sensor is transferred to the row readout. As the row is being read out, the photodiodes are reset and can begin a new exposure. After the first row is read out, the outputs from the second row are selected, transferring them to the row readout. The second row is reset and begins a new exposure. This process continues until the entire image sensor is read out, at which time the first row is ready to be read out again. You've seen that the basic CMOS image sensor incorporates three transistors along with a photodiode for each pixel. Transferring a voltage rather than a charge packet gives better performance. You may have noticed, though, that each row is exposed at a slightly different time. This leads us into the discussion of a rolling shutter. Here is what the exposure timing might look like for the CMOS image sensor previously described. Each row is exposed at a time slightly later than the previous row. For this reason, it is called a rolling shutter. Let's look at what happens when imaging a moving object such as a roller bearing. This may be the image we expect, but because each scan line is exposed at a slightly different time, with the top line first and the bottom line last, 
the rolling shutter causes the image of a moving object to have skew, a distortion. To fix the distortion caused when imaging with a rolling shutter requires the addition of two more transistors and a capacitor, as shown in this schematic. The way this works is that all photo sensors on the image sensor are reset at the same time. There is a period of exposure, and again all photo sensors are exposed at the same time. Then the charge from every photo sensor is transferred onto its capacitor simultaneously. After the transfer, the photo sensor is reset to be ready for the next exposure even while the image data is being read out. A row is selected and the pixel amplitudes are read out sequentially. After the readout is complete and before the next exposure can be transferred, the capacitors are reset to be ready to accept new charge packets from the photosensors. Here's a diagram of the CMOS Global Shutter Image Sensor in action. Reset 1 resets the photosensor. Reset 2 resets the storage capacitor. When Reset 1 is removed, Exposure begins. Reset 2 must be removed before the transfer of charge from the photosensors to the storage capacitor. The charge from all pixels is transferred from the photosensors to the corresponding storage capacitors in parallel. After the transfer is complete, the photosensors can be reset in preparation for the next exposure. The first row is selected and the voltage from each of its pixels is transferred to a storage capacitor on the row readout. The columns are selected sequentially, causing the pixel values from the first row to be read out in sequence. That process is repeated for the second and subsequent row. After the last row of pixels is transferred to the horizontal readout, the storage capacitors for all pixels can be reset. One advantage of CMOS over CCD is that CMOS can facilitate the fabrication of processing circuits on the image sensing chip. A common enhancement on CMOS image sensors is the addition of an analog to digital converter for each column of pixels. This means the output of the image sensor is a digital number rather than an analog voltage. Clearly, a global shutter is better for imaging moving objects than is a rolling shutter, since it will not produce the skew distortion characteristic of rolling shutters. But the global shutter has a drawback. The two additional transistors and a capacitor take up some additional room on each pixel, causing the sensing area to decrease, reducing the fill factor. This means the global shutter image sensor will be somewhat less sensitive than the rolling shutter image sensor. All things being otherwise equal, the global shutter device might have a slight increase in noise. CMOS has another characteristic that is different from CCD. While for most applications this is not a drawback, it is something for which you should be aware. In CCD, there are only a few layers of material between the photo sensor and the micro lens. CMOS image sensors have a number of alternating layers of insulation and metal conductors that surround each photo sensor. This means the photo sensor is looking through a tunnel. With the micro lens on the stack, when the light rays from the lens are normal to the surface, there is a little light lost. As the angles of the light rays move away from the normal, there is more light lost due to the tunnel. This means that there will be more shading on a CMOS image sensor than on a CCD image sensor for short focal length lenses. For most machine vision applications, this is not a noticeable effect. Let's review what we've covered in this video. The passive CMOS image sensor is simple and low cost to manufacture, but it delivers poor performance since charge packets must travel some distance from the photo sensor to the output amplifier. The three transistor CMOS image sensor changes a pixel's output from a charge packet to a voltage and gives higher performance for both speed and noise. However, the three transistor CMOS has a rolling shutter that can result in skew distortion when imaging a moving object. The five transistor CMOS image sensor gives a global shutter 
which is preferable for imaging moving objects. Many, one could say most, CMOS image sensors have A to D circuits on chip. The image sensor's output is digital rather than analog. Because of the construction of CMOS image sensors, each photo sensor is located at the bottom of a tunnel. This can cause some shading when using short focal length lenses. We've touched on the basics of CMOS image sensors. There are many companies working to develop ever improved versions by incorporating features beyond what we've discussed. Still, after watching this video, you are prepared to understand how CMOS image sensors operate. The next video moves beyond the image sensor to explore some of the common features offered by most machine vision cameras.